Praise Yahweh. I want to talk to you about a, a topic that should be near and dear to all of our hearts. It's the topic of repentance. Amen? We say we may have heard this before, this message, but you can never really leave this message to get too far away from it. Or at least you never should. Amen? Praise Yahweh. I want to ask you guys a question, which is the title of the message is. The question is, do you as a believer, do you have the fruit of repentance in your life? Do you as a believer have the fruit of repentance in your life? Hallelujah. Now turn with me to Matthew chapter 3. We're going to look at the preaching of a man named John. Now we're not talking about the writer of the, the gospel of John. We're not talking about the one who authored the first, second, third John. Nor are we talking about, oh, so all three of these Johns are the same, the, the one who wrote down the Revelation. But we're talking about John the Baptist. He preached a message on this topic of the fruit of repentance that we need to pay attention to. Many people don't really give John or, th- or the credit or think of him as a preacher. But he was a preacher. And we want to learn something here from him today. But well, to catch you up in chapter 3, it says, well, let's just read that. It says in, in verse 1, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness in Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, speaking of John, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of Yahweh, make his path straight. Amen? Now we're going to stop there and think about this. John the Baptist is, is pr- crying out. He's preaching. And he's talking to, I want you to know, he's talking to the people of Yahweh, Israel, telling them to repent. Make your path straight, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I'm thinking about us today. And as we have an outlook on a couple of feasts coming up, the Feast of Trumpets. You know, the Feast of Trumpets. The sound, the trumpet is sounding out. It's alerting us. It's letting us know, number one, to get ready. Hallelujah. It's letting us know that, hallelujah, that he will, with a blast of a trumpet, he's going to come forth out of the heavens. Amen. And bring his kingdom upon earth. The Feast of Trumpets. We... He's saying, get ready, prepare yourself. Yeshua said to us, he said that no one knows the day nor the hour. Amen? But he said, watch. In other words, get ready. Prepare yourself. We may not know exactly the day or hour he comes, but we do know that we can prepare ourselves and be ready until such a time as he does come. Amen? Amen? We can be ready. He said, watch. And so we have trumpets sounding. Get ready. Alert. Amen? For the kingdom of heaven is coming. He is coming. Then we have after that atonement. Amen? We see the atonement, which, which also is another trumpet. Each feast in itself is a, is a type of trumpet, a call going out. Amen? Telling us, hey, after our Savior, His death, burial, and resurrection, our high priest went up into the heavenly tabernacle. He ascended. Amen? Did He not? And He went into the heavenly tabernacle... And the Bible says, there he giveth, uh, with his sacrifice, he's already, the sacrifice of given, there he giveth intercession for us before the throne of Yahweh. For, right? For us, his people. Amen? And now the, the atonement doesn't end there. There's still a part that has to be fulfilled. Amen? The call, the trumpet still sounds. It says that we now are waiting for his second coming. He has to come back. Amen? From out of the, uh, the Holy of Holies where he was before making intercession, you know, for us. He has to come back out because the people waited. They waited in awe. They called them the days of awe. They waited, basically, and they had to keep themselves. They had to keep themselves prepared. They had to have be cleansed and washed and wait because when he came, he came out with the judgment, the high priest. It was a very momentous occasion. And the Bible says that when Yeshua comes again, he's going to come as he came the first time as a servant, right? As a lamb. The second time he's going to become as a judge as a king judging both the quick and the dead 
Am I right? Hallelujah. He's going to come. And so we hear that trumpet. Then we, uh, of course, we have the Feast of Tabernacles, which is coming up. The third trumpet, which celebrates how, he, how, how when he comes the second time, how the first time he tabernacled you know, as, as a, with us in body as a lamb, but how he's going to come and, 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 and uh, tabernacle us, uh, with us as king, as Lord, and his kingdom will, will reign on earth, and we will celebrate those of us who are right before him, those of us who have been judged. He will judge the world, and the whole world will be full of his glory and, and, and uh, his, his law. And so we have these trumpets, but I'm here to tell you, I want to speak about the first tabernacle he came. John was a trumpet. He himself was a voice. The prophet Isaiah says, crying out in the wilderness, trumpeting loud as Brother Tony blows his shofar, trumpeting, say, saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Hallelujah. He says, prepare ye the way of Yahweh. Make his path straight. And I want you to look at, at verse 7. It says here, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to, to the baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who have warned you of to flee from the wrath to come? See, he, talk, he was talking to the Pharisees, not just to, to the people of Israel, but to the leaders. The people who are the most religious of all, of the church. These are the people of Yahweh. Yeshua said, I come to the kingdom of Israel first, my people, the people who are called out, the people who I brought out of Egypt, the people who I, I presented my law to. I come to the nation of Israel first. Amen? And so he's calling to his people that they must come out. And he says for them to repent. Hallelujah. And he says in verse 8, he ends it up with, Bring forth therefore fruit, meat for repentance. And so the obvious question we ask ourselves is, what does this fruit mean for repentance? What does it look like? When we see someone repenting, what is, what is it that we are to observe as fruit mean for repentance? What is it in ourselves that we should that demonstrates fruit mean for repentance? What is it that Yahweh is looking for, more importantly than all, what He wants to see that, that we should describe as fruit mean for repentance? Well, luckily for us, we look in this passage and it contains four fruits of repentance described here within the message in the preaching of John the Baptist. Hallelujah. Repentance, of course, we all know is the starting point in every believer's life. We begin our walk with Elohim admitting, number one, that we need Yeshua. We need His work on Calvary. Amen. We express our sorrow for our sin, you know, in our life. Amen. And, 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 we also, we, we, we're not going too far into it, but the baptism also is included in this, which represents after a, a, a washing of his word, you know, the law, the water, and things of nature is also needed within us. But if each of us have had a genuine moment of repentance, hallelujah, then we should have developed fruit, fruit in our lives. Seeds have been planted, they've been watered, and they should grow forth in our lives. The fruit of repentance. And these fruits that are growing in our lives, they should continue and be able to be observed way past the first initial salvation. But they should continue to show and be demonstrated because they are the foundation at, at the foot of the tree of Calvary from which we all think everything else should be built upon. These fruits of repentance should, should be, continue to be observed in our lives. Amen? Now, let's, as we study these fruits, I want you to keep in mind the harsh words of John the Baptist in verse 7. He's speaking to the church, the, the leaders of the church. He calls them a brood of vipers. He says, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Who is he? He's talking to, like I said, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The very religious among many. Now, there are people here this morning in this very church who are very religious. You know, but if we're not bearing the fruit of Yahweh like we should, the Bible says that we, no matter how religious we can be, that we are distant from Yahweh. Hallelujah. Somewhere along the line, we, we from, from the Calvary 
we to till now we let the enemy come in with pride or or something and, and gobble up the fruit. So we're going to study about the four fruits of repentance. And this passage, I, I hope you'll see, points towards us. I want you to look inward. Let's start with verse 9 and read. Verse 9 of Matthew chapter 3. And think not to say within yourselves, Ye have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that Elohim is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. You see, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they, they were quick to bring up when John was coming to them to reprove and correct them and, and saying they need to repent. They would say, what? We need to repent? They were quick to bring up their ancestry, their history of their family. You know, wait a minute. We are, and John knew this because the Spirit, Holy Spirit revealed this to John in, in his heart. They, they were like, wait a minute. We're, we're, we're saved. They based their salvation on their, on their histor- hi- historical family lineage. You know, we're children of Abraham. What do we need to repent from? You know, we have the oracles, right, of, of the law and all these other things. That he's the one that brought us up in Egypt. You know, but what did, what did John say to him? He said, he said, Yahweh is able to raise up these stones. Amen? These stones. Don't, don't, in other words, throw your history away. They were putting... Somewhere on the line, lines, his, Yahweh's people, these, these religious leaders, got away from, from, from the foundation of the fruit meat for repentance. And they began to use this family thing this, to, to puff themselves up to where they began to resist the reproving of John. They began to, to fight against it, and they used this, this thing, I would say, pride. See, people don't know it, but... but and they, they, people can't see themselves. It's pride. Pride, which I believe is the root of all sin. The Pharisees were sitting there and they were saying, wait a minute. You're saying we got to repent? They were getting, you know, we are the children of Abraham. They were getting puffed up in themselves. And this pride was like blinders into their eyes. They couldn't see their need. You know, pride will cause you to not see your nakedness and your want. And see your, your dependent, you know, your need. Your, like the Bible says, you're naked. You are diseased. They couldn't see their need. Amen? And so, it's a similar thing, same thing today. We, I, I like to bring it to the day, to us. There are people in the church, you know, who, well, look, I'm a Baptist. You know, I'm a Pentecostal. I'm a sacred name believer. I'm a Messianic. You know, who are you to come to me and tell me, you know, uh, get all puffed up, but I need to repent. Well, I'm a pastor. You're a little boy. How can you come to me and tell me where I need to repent? You know? You know, I've been living and walking in this way in so long, and I know what I need to be doing. Who are you? But see, people always want to shoot the messenger. But what they should be doing is looking at the message. Right? They should be looking at the message. Because the message comes... It's not with the messenger, but it's who the messenger came from. Right? Yahweh can use a donkey, right? He can use a donkey to speak the word and let you know where you need to, to correct yourself. So it doesn't matter if, you know, if, the, if Yahweh is using an imperfect person before you to correct you who are also imperfect. It doesn't matter. But we get so puffed up in ourselves with pride and stuff. And, and you know, my father, he built this church. And, and, and my mom, she, she headed up the women's prayer meeting for 20 some odd years. Who are you to tell me, Right? So that leads us to the to the first fruit of repentance. Humility. Humility is the first fruit of repentance. Humility is what we had when we first came to salvation. Right? When we first realized that um, we, we we began at repentance, bowing down. We didn't we, we realized our need. We didn't do anything to earn this, this thing called salvation. We realized it was all Him and that we were lost. But somewhere along the line, we lost that fruit of humility when it should have stayed with us. Amen? 
we read on in, in the same in the same thing. Um, it says here, um, hold up. Yahweh is able to to to, 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 to uh, raise up the stones, up children to Abraham. We look at that, and we say to ourselves, "How can we get so boastful in ourselves? How can we get so caught up to the point where where we just refuse to accept the correction, refuse to accept, you know, the reproof?" That's what they were doing with John, and John said. Forget it. Throw it away. Your faith it should be not on your works, not on the works of, of uh, other people, but should be on the grace of Yahweh. You should have humility. You need to be humbled. Amen? Like the scripture says, my people who are called by my name, if they will humble themselves and pray, then I will heal their land. Amen? Praise Yahweh. So there, there's a place of humbling we need to be in our hearts. And it's a place that we receive, but we didn't deserve. And we're supposed to stay in that place. It doesn't. It's not supposed to end just at initial salvation. It's supposed to be a place that stays in us, the fruit of humility, 10 years, 20 years after we've been saved. Humble, so that to a place where Yahweh, Father Yahweh, I want to serve you. I realize in me that I have, have sinned. I realize in me that there's no good thing. And this person has come to me and told me, this little child, the pastor, that there's a sin within me. There's something that I need to repent from. Father Yahweh, is, is it true? What is that sin? Come and take it out. Amen? If there be a sin, Father Yahweh, let me, I repent from it. Hallelujah. So, as we continue on, let's read 10a. It says, John says, And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Often in our lives, we'll look at our sins that we've committed, and individually we can explain them away. We can minimize the sins that we have we, we give excuses for them you say I haven't committed an axe murder you know I haven't gone off on a shooting spree you know my sin is nothing major you know we can, I'll get to them another day we can excuse it we say stuff like well you know um, I can still get in the kingdom of heaven with this sin and we have we have a wrong attitude about it all about sins we, we consider sin small Amen? We do that. We consider it small. Then we get to the point where we begin to procrastinate and just put it off. Keep putting it off. And you know what? When we look at this thing, we need to realize that number one, Yeshua died for all our sins. He died for the sins. Our Savior died for each and every one of our sins. That alone needs to let us know that even the sin that we consider the smallest is too much to bear. And But we don't look at our sins like, like they're, they're as serious as they are. So therefore we don't have the fruit number two, which is urgency. We don't have the urgency to come quickly and deal with the sin in our life because we want to minimize it. We want to make it less than it really is. We want to take this sin... And put it in a place where we don't have to, we can deal you know the pleasure of sin whether it be uh, uh, I want to hold on to unforgiveness or whether it be I want to, uh, there's a certain pleasure I, you know, that I like maybe lusting after a woman you know uh, this is a small sins and everything but we don't realize our attitude is wrong number one it's a, we know that Yahweh in His Word says these things are sin and the fact that we continue to hang on to these sins. Is, is our attitude is rebellion and the Bible says that the sin of rebellion is what? is witchcraft and the Bible also says that witches sorcerers idolaters all these will not inherit the kingdom of heaven right? right? amen? so number one our attitude is wrong number two like I mentioned before 
Our Savior died. He gave His life for each and every sin. And so therefore there is no small sin. The little white lie that I tell is not small, but big. Yeshua said that you can be a whole lump of righteous dough, but a little bit of leaven, if a little bit of sin does what? It levels the whole lump as far as your relationship to Yahweh. Right? So is there? can I afford to think of my sin as small? The attitude is off. Yahweh commands that we we are to everyone here ever look at play darts or or know, or know about like the dart board. You got the bullseye, and the bullseye is is right smack in the middle, and then around it you got little circles and then other outer circles and all the way to the end. And the points get lower and lower, right? The further away to get from the bullseye, correct? Well, the Bible says that we are to strive for the you know to reach the high calling, the mark. You know. The, the Bible says we're, Yahweh commands that we are to strive for the mark of perfection. We are to strive to hit the bullseye every time. That is supposed to be our attitude. Hit the bullseye. But some of us, now we, if we strive to hit the bullseye, we may only hit the 70%. We may only hit the 90%, the 60 But we're supposed to strive to hit the bullseye. That's what Yahweh wants in His Word, right? But some of us have this bad attitude where, um, that's okay, I'm just going to hit the 60 Boom. I'm going to aim for the 20. That's good. As long as I keep racking up 20 points, Yahweh will accept that and get me into his kingdom. A lot of people lose the urgency. John the Baptist is saying that to the Pharisees and Sadducees, to the people of Yahweh, the axe is at the root. You're about to get cut off. Is that what he's saying? There's an urgency that now is the time to repent. Don't wait until later, right? Is that what John the Baptist is saying? Don't put off. You know? Who church? Who church has warned you? Time is wrapping. Who warned you? You vipers. You, know, you brood of vipers. Who has warned you of the wrath to come? Because every time we minimize our small little sins, we are setting ourselves up for wrath that is to come. Is that right? So we, somewhere along the line, at the foot of Calvary, we got too mature. We grew up. We became, we got puffed up and, and, and we don't, we lost our urgency, the fruit of urgency. We lost the humility. We don't need no, when we first got saved, it was like, Yeshua, I love you, I thank you, I just want to please you. Whatever is in me, I, you know, I just want your light to be, be shining. But we left that, we left that place where we were, where we were like, oh, uh, you know, Yahweh, just, just take this thing out of me. Oh, I sinned, I don't want to sin, I, I just want to please you. We left that place and got to this place where, oh, it's just a little sin. It'll be all right. You know, I'm still going to make it. It's not a salvation issue. You know, I'll make it in. You know, rebellion. Rebellion. The urgency. Now is the time. Like Mike, uh, Mike Tomlin, the Steelers coach. Get a little football thing. It's football season, you know. He, he, one thing I liked about preseason, he, he, you know, they were having little special teams problems. Um, they, they got their field goals p- blocked. He said, one thing about us, when a problem comes up, we make it disappear. That next uh, preseason training, they, they worked on that. The field goal unit, the special teams. They, until, until they made sure that you know, it was less likely to be blocked and it was going to stop being blocked. They worked on it. He said, we make things disappear. Now, Mike Tomlin is talking about a simple, small little football game where they're trying to reach a little Super Bowl, right? We're talking about the Super Bowl of Salvation. We're talking about, we don't want a, a, a little perishable trophy, right? Vince Lombardi trophy. We want the trophy where Yeshua himself says, Well done, thy good and faithful servant, right? We, 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 how much more should we have an urgency to make that small sin that we consider so significant disappear? Amen? You know? Amen. So we, the fruit of humility, one. The fruit of urgency, two. Praise Yahweh. When we are made aware of our sin, we need to be at the point where we say, Yahweh, forgive me. Take it away right away. Don't procrastinate. Father Yahweh, you know, my priority is you. This sin I have in my life is not excusable. Father Yahweh, it's not as small. I want to live, please you. I want to become more and more like you from the day I was saved to, to the, I want to become more and more like you and the rest of the sins that, that I might sin after I'm saved 
I want them to disappear. I want them to be gone because I want to be like you, to walk like you, to talk to you like you. I want to please you because I want to be in heaven. John the Baptist said, Who warned you, O church? Hallelujah. He said, Repent, church, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Amen? Praise Yahweh. Praise Yahweh. Urgency, as soon as possible. Verse 10b. Read that with me. It says, verse 10b says, Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, we as believers, we claim as believers that finding Yahweh is not all about religion, right? It's about relationship, right? That's what we claim as believers. But we also claim that we have a personal relationship with Elohim through Yeshua the Messiah. Is that correct? All right? That means that every Christian, or so-called Christian, claims to have had a personal encounter with the most powerful being in the universe. Not just, matter of fact, the one who created the universe. The one who the universe can't even contain him. The Bible says the heavens of heavens can't contain him. So you would think that to come away from such an encounter would mean that you would not be the same, right? Your life would be altered, correct? It would be for, for changed, right? Wouldn't you think that? But yet, sadly, too often, folks that claim to know Elohim and to have met him continue to live unaltered lives. All right? This is fruit number three. Okay? Verse 10 reminds us of the third fruit, which is change. Fruit of repentance. Change. Now, the church in America has too long presumed that we can be a Christian, and yet we can have absolutely no evidence that, you know, that change has occurred in our life. A man named Henry Blackaby, the author of Experiencing God, recently noted that there are just as many abortions inside the church as outside the church. There, there's only 1% difference in gambling inside the church as outside the church. Another man named George Barna did a survey of 152 separate items comparing the lost world and the churches. And he said there is virtually no difference between the two. Now, is that a serious accusation? No difference. Where is the fruits meet for repentance in the church today, saints? I don't know about you, but in my Heavenly Father's Word, in His Bible, His book, there's nothing of a faith about a faith that does not change a person's life. I don't know. You know, Yeshua said in, in the book of John 14, He said, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teachings. And he who does not love me will not obey my teachings. So see, there's supposed to be a change. We are not supposed to be just as many as people inside the church living shacked up together unmarried as we see today. We are not supposed to see homosexuals and stuff ruling within the church, leading the church. We're supposed to see a difference, a change. Amen? Is that what fruit of repentance is the third fruit change hallelujah praise Yahweh we, repentance is supposed to be you walk in one direction you realize the error of your ways you change and walk the up opposite direction correct this way this spirit of uh, uh, this this uh, fruit of change should be continued to be in our lives, not just at initial salvation, but it should continue. Matter of fact, this fruit of change should should continue throughout our walk as believers, throughout our walk as His Holy Spirit leads and guides us to truth and, and, and new light and revelation is shined to us. We are supposed to constantly be changing more and more into the image of Father Yahweh, going from glory to glory to glory into the Son. And it made it to the image of Yeshua the Messiah, changing more and more, being perfected, you know, being, getting that draw out as we're gold, being purified, changing more and more. That repentance, the fruit of repentance should be a way of life for us. But we left it. 
Some, some of us left it. We got too mature for that. We outgrew it. Hallelujah. But we're supposed to be experiencing joy and relief of Yahweh's forgiveness as we come to Him. We're supposed to recognize the cost of our forgiveness was Yeshua's death on Calvary. We're supposed to understand that our sin cost Yeshua His life. Hallelujah. We walk this journey of faith with the constant desire to become more and more like Him and rid ourselves of the sins in our lives. Hallelujah. As soon as possible. Hallelujah. One, because we have urgency. And two, because we know that true repentance requires change. Amen. So, let's turn to verse 11. Verse 11 says, Hallelujah. It says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I. Those whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Hallelujah. Praise Yahweh for the word of Yahweh. Hallelujah. Now, there's a lot that this verse has in it. But I want you to pay particular attention to John's point or assertion that there is one coming after him that is mightier, he says, than I. This is a powerful Savior we're talking about, right? A powerful Savior. Hallelujah. So, what we learn here is that the act of repentance includes admitting, number one, that we messed up. Alright? We messed up. Do we fall short? Let me hear everyone say, I fall short. I fall short. That's right. And not only are, did we mess up, but we are messed up. We are messed up in and of ourselves. Right? Separate from Father Yahweh, we are messed up. Is that not true? Let me hear you say, I messed up. I messed up. That's right. Amen? And so, you know, if Yeshua is our shepherd, I, you guys have heard me say this before, that we are his sheep. And sheep, as, as animals, are dumb. Right? And, but the smartest sheep know they're dumb. The f- dumb sheep don't realize they're dumb. Okay? So if you realize you're dumb, then you're going to follow everything the shepherd does. Everything the shepherd wants. You're going to not rely on your own intelligence, not your own power, not your own might. Amen? So this brings us to the fourth fruit, which is in the final fruit of repentance, which is dependent, I mean, of uh, righteousness, which is dependence on him. The final fruit of repentance is dependence on him. Okay? We got... Let, let's see who's paying attention. What's the first fruit here? Humility. What's the second fruit? Uh, urgency. What's the third fruit? And the fourth fruit? Dependence. On Him. Recognizing in our repentance that we have fallen short. We admit our sin. And we, as we just noticed, we pursue a changed life. But obviously we failed in the past. Hallelujah. We need to be ever mindful that we are in ourselves failures. Matter of fact, this has to do a lot in connection with our humility. Ever mindful that we, there's nothing good in me. I'm darkness. You know, I'm lost without Him. Only reason why I'm able to have humility and stuff is because I realize this. I'm mindful. I didn't, I have this fruit in my life, this fruit that grew up from the foot of Calvary when I first was saved. That's why, just so as a side note, you think about the elders in the Revelation, it says that they bowed down, they, they were kings, and they, and they says they, they had crowns, and they took their crowns off and threw it to, at the foot of our Savior. It's because they realized that even then, after, after it was Yahweh who, who brought them from this place of darkness, of loss, where they could do nothing, deserving of themselves, to be in this place of heaven where they are now. Even then, as we're, they're in heaven with the crowns that He put on their face, these crowns belong to Him. He alone has done the work. Amen? He alone is worthy. Amen? And so our dependence from birth, or as some would say, from the tomb to the womb, or from the womb to the tomb, i got a, a dyslexic, sorry for that. From the, to- from the womb to the tomb, our dependence and on into heaven is on Him. Amen? 
So, the good news for us today is that we are in this position that we are in because we depend on Him. And we realize that He's the one that provides all our resources. And obviously, we can't rely on our own strength, our own power. And if we started anew from a Calvary at salvation, we obviously this walk, this new life, this better life, this, this idea of repenting and changing and becoming better, we can't do our own. We need something more than our power, something more than our strength. We need something more than our wisdom, obviously, right? We need to depend on Him. And this is a fruit that should not, we should not outgrow. It, it shouldn't be that, you know, after ten years after our salvation experience, we become too puffed up and mighty and forget about the fruit of our dependence on Father Yahweh. We shouldn't. But many of us have. Amen? Many of us have, have been working hard to achieve these things in our own power and strength. And you know what? We're going to be doomed to fail every time. You agree with that? If you are working in your own strength, in your own power, in your own wisdom and might and smarts to, to achieve the, this getting better and this growing in y'all, you're going to fail every time. Everyone agree that, with that? Hey Amen. So now, I want to, as we wrap this up, I want you to ask yourself a simple question this morning or today. Can you see the fruits of repentance in your life, both day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, second by second? Or are you just standing in this morning with the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Are you making up excuses? Are you minimizing? Are you saying to yourself, my family, look at my mom, I was raised in the church, my mom did this, my dad did this. Are you, are you resisting the, the reproof of, of, of people and looking at the messenger and not at the message that comes from Yahweh? Have you, have you been clouded because of pride and puffed upness? Have you forgotten that you are nothing, you're lower than dust? Have you forgotten that, that the only thing we depend on is Yahweh's grace? To keep our salvation is based on and, and, and to keep us from um, the wrath that is to come. Ask yourself that. And Yahweh bless you.